For 50 years, fighter planes have been obsolete. It is the single biggest procurement failure in military history. The engineering that allows an aircraft to go from the current design state of 9Gs to 12Gs is actually straightforward. The fact that no test aircraft has ever been built is truly the astounding part of it. Current fighter planes are designed to a 9G standard. That is nine times the acceleration of gravity for turning itself. The limitations of turning are the amount of force that the wings can create relative to the weight of the aircraft, the strength of the wing to withstand the loading, and the ability of the pilot to withstand the loading. All three of those problems can be solved, and the 9G standard can be raised to a 12G standard. Fighter wing skins are designed 30 to 40% thicker than they need for strength. The reason for the increased thickness is to make the wing torsionally stiffer. Torsional stiffness down the length of the wing is extremely important in fighter aircraft design to enable it to maintain high levels of maneuverability. The strength limitation is the wing skin buckling under bending load. It's referred to as thin walled buckling. If the wing skins are reduced to the buckling limit, then the length of the cord, the front to back measure of the wing, can be increased 30 to 40 percent while keeping the wingspan constant. There is now more wing area for the same weight. The more wing area creates more force, that increases a higher turning rate, and allows for a 12G standard. The form of a wing is typically expressed in aspect ratio. That's the wing span divided by the average cord length. Naval aircraft have an aspect ratio of four because they need to have lower landing speeds to land on an aircraft carrier. That high aspect ratio makes the wings heavier, which makes the fighter aircraft heavier, less maneuverable, and also, the wing winds up being less efficient for supersonic flight. Air Force fighters have an aspect ratio of 2.5 to 1. That is still a compromise for landing speeds. It's better for high-speed flight. It's better for maneuvering for the fighter aircraft, but it's still not ideal. An aspect ratio of less than 2 is what you really want for a fighter aircraft maneuvering at 500 to 600 miles an hour. By reducing the 1.3 to 1.4 wing skin thickness, you then wind up with an aspect ratio of 1.8 or 1.7. This is closer to what you really want for that high-speed maneuvering and makes the aircraft more efficient in high-speed flight and in supersonic flight as well. The problem with this design is that at low speeds, it doesn't produce lift. It has a high stalling speed. So for takeoffs and landings, it's not efficient. Therefore, you would a separate lifting wing. It takes off in two pieces. It separates. There is an arm linking the lifting wing with the fighter aircraft. The fighter aircraft separates and can now fly off and do 12G maneuvers. The engineering is actually fairly straightforward. By removing the landing gear from the fighter aircraft, about 1,000 pounds can be. Inside the wings, when you expand them, when you make them longer, there is an additional need for some more framework. Those are the span-wise wing spars and the front-to-back cords. 1,000 pounds from the landing gear would represent a volume of about seven cubic feet of aluminum, which would be more than enough for the additional internal structures to the wing. By having a separate lifting wing, it can be built with straight wings, which can enable to actually take off on a shorter runway, making the fighter aircraft more flexible. The increased length of the wing and a concomitant increase in height wing thickness allows for a much larger volume inside the wing and a much larger volume of internal fuel carried, which reduces the need for external fuel tank. By making the wing 30% thicker in cord, 30 to 40% thicker in cord, and reducing the wing skin thickness from the 30 to 40% increment down to one, the buckling limit, the sectional stiffness of the wing remains constant. The longer cord produces a stiff wing form. So there is a very stiff wing, which is exactly what you want for a fighter aircraft. The connecting arm would probably need to have a wire cable at the front end of it to stabilize it and raise the fighter aircraft. When the fighter aircraft is in the raised position, there is a need to have some kind of transfer, a strut system that would connect in some manner to the fuselage of the fighter, linking it to the lifting wing. This allows the thrust of the fighter engine to be transferred into the lifting wing, so both the lifting wing engines and the fighter engines can be used for takeoff and allowing for any emergencies during landing. The pilot would have to be in a water-filled suit. The water-filled bladders were used Back in World War II, the U.S. Navy experimented with them for dive bomber pilots. Royal Canadian Air Force developed them for fighter pilots. The Royal Air Force, Britain, produced them for fighter pilots. They were never used in combat. So an internal water bladder suit is certainly something that can be built. Outside of the water bladder suit, you need some kind of other material to hold the bladder and prevent it from becoming misshapen and all the water going down into the legs. By having a water-filled suit, the pressure from the water contains the pilot's body. 
what happens under geoloading is blood moves out of the pilot's upper body and his head particularly and drains into the legs. The leg skin expands slightly under the pressure created by the geoloading of turning and the draining of blood causes the pilot to lose consciousness. A water-filled suit stops all. Outside the water-filled bladder, you would need to have some kind of high-strength fiber suit, relatively high fiber suit at least, to contain the bladder and again prevent it from shifting out of position. Forces are not very great. When a pilot is sitting, the distance from the pilot's shoulders to his ankle is maybe four feet. Fresh water weighs 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. Multiplied by four gives 250. Multiplied by 12 Gs gives 3,000. Divided by 144 square inches per square foot, and you get a number of about 20. Atmospheric pressure at sea level is 14.7 pounds per square inch. An astronaut suit probably has 8 to 10 pounds of pressure. The suits astronauts use for spacewalks. So you're looking at material that would have to be stiffer than an astronaut spacesuit. The material strength is not hard to achieve. There is something called high modulus polyethylene that has a tensile strength of over 100,000 pounds per square inch. A pilot's ankle is four inches across, allowing for the waterfall suit. At 20 pounds per square inch, it's 80 pounds. It's half on each side, so it's 40 pounds. And again, you can have even a fairly significant safety factor of even 400 pounds, and you would only need one two hundred fiftieth of an inch per linear inch. So you can have thin fibers, something like high modulus polyethylene woven into maybe a nylon suit. At the pilot's ankles, you could have a Velcro wrap that's maybe three inches wide that just wraps around the pilot's boot to hold the suit and prevent it from distorting. There are considerations of such things as the interaction between the main wing and the horizontal stabilizer. Vertical stabilizers can be placed under the body of the aircraft. The reason they're above the body of the aircraft is clearance for takeoffs and landings. You put long landing gear on the lifting wing, you can then put the vertical stabilizers under. The vertical stabilizer under subsonic flight can be made significantly smaller because the vertical stabilizer is needed, one, for low speed flight, but you're not going to do low speed flight. It's not going to separate from the lifting wing until it's traveling at 400 miles an hour or faster. And the other reason is to keep the vertical stabilizer in clean air when the plane is at a high angle of attack so the plane doesn't destabilize and go into a spin. By putting them under the fuselage, they are in the flow of the air when the plane is at a high angle of attack, so that's not a problem. The pressure term increases as the square of the velocity, plus there's another term that goes as 1 over 1 minus Mach number squared, Kendall Glauert. So that's not a problem. Supersonic flight, you need larger vertical stabilizers. In supersonic flight, there is another consideration that has to be achieved, and that could be the limiting factor of how big they have. Because there is a phenomenon known as roll your coupling, there is roll your coupling in supersonic flight. The vertical stabilizer isn't as efficient. Lifting surfaces are less efficient on a flight, and there is gyroscopic action. If a plane is doing two movements at once, if it's rolling, lifting one wing and dropping the other, and yawing, turning left or right, there is also a component of pitch that these tend to add up, and you can wind up with severe roll your coupling. They found this out with the first supersonic fighter plane, the F-100. They had to make its vertical stabilizer about 30% larger. So again, that could be the limiting factor. But overall, the design of the aircraft is pretty straightforward. Air-to-air -air missiles have a powered flight for about 40% of their range, and then they become a glider. They use their kinetic energy. In order to intercept a 12G fighter, you need larger control surfaces. You need to burn more fuel. It's going to have more drag. And overall, it's going to have a much shorter range. You have a 12G fighter fighting a 9G fighter, the 12G fighter can fire its missiles at a much longer range and still be effective because the fighter plane has to rejoin with the lifting wing. And in order to do that with only one pilot, you'd have to have some kind of probably a laser system connecting arm to make the connection. And those laser systems became available by something by 1970. By 1968-69, laser-guided bombs were being used in Vietnam and Laos. And that's pretty much the same system. So the system would have been available. But like everything else, nobody's interested in doing it, so it doesn't get done. Even a 12G fighter is relatively straightforward. But the amazing thing is, no one will listen. Not the Air Force, not the Navy. People think it's amusing, or they ignore it. It can be done. The engineering is fairly straightforward, and it's useless contacting the U.S. military. I've tried. 